All right, questions, guys, come on. No shyness. I know it's the Philippines. So why didn't, uh, why not the Jews accept uh, Jesus as the Messiah? What were you schluffing the whole time? What were, <laughs> what were you doing here? What were you doing? You stop playing solitaire? <laughs> The reason is because there is no relationship between what the Bible says about the Messiah and what Christians teach about the Messiah. Question in the back there. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Naomi. I have a question. Um, sure. I have Jewish friends, and most of them are Israelis. I'm just wondering, because we haven't heard the answer yet, if you agree. So that's my first question. And then the second one is, does the Tanakh have a specific definition or description of the coming Messiah? Because... Most of my Israeli friends who believe in the Messiah, since most of them are secular um, Jews. And then, last question would be Daniel 9. What do you think about Daniel 9? But this is, I mean, for me, I've read it. What do you think about Daniel 9? Yeah, I did did a TV show last night on Daniel 9. It was a one-hour show. <laughs> okay, did you come late to the program? I'm not trying to apologize, but the second question I was the, was what the lecture was about. Oh, um, yeah. Okay, so because I okay, but let me let me just address question one, and question two will. I'll, I'll I'll briefly, but that was the substance of the evening's program. Let's talk about Isaiah 53. It's a delicious chapter. <laughs> the the problem is honestly. That Christians know Isaiah 53 backwards and forwards. You know, Bart, if I ask you what to say in Isaiah 53, you'll probably have a good idea of what's in there, right? Yes. Let me ask you a question, honestly. If I ask you what's in Isaiah 52. I don't know. Ah. So, or 54. I'm not sure. I have to look it up. Now, let me ask you a question before I answer. This is not a direct answer. How dangerous, how dangerous is it if you take any book of 66 chapters, and please forgive me, I, and you only know the 53rd chapter, how much trouble can you possibly get into? How likely is it that you might not understand the chapter of any book, even if it's not a holy book? Let's say you take a, a novel. Imagine you take a novel and you go to the 53rd chapter of the novel, you wouldn't know what's going on. And my, my sister, I apologize, but this is very true for Christians. They complain that Jews don't read Isaiah 53, but Christians do not read 65 chapters of Isaiah. They only read 53, and they know it by heart. And this is the problem. And then they go to Jews and accuse them, you don't know 53. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But let me, let me, I want to answer you, because that was an indirect answer, because it's very important people go, oh, Jews don't know Isaiah 53. Christians don't know Isaiah 52 and 54. And this is a, this is a, this is a problem. But let me, let me answer your question directly. Whenever you're studying scripture, you have to ask a question. And that is, any chapter, who is speaking? And that's, if you don't know who is speaking, you're not going to understand. I mean, that's, that, that is um, axiomatic. So I'll ask you a question. In Isaiah 53, who is the one speaking? Who's talking? How important do you think, my sister, it is to know who is talking? Probably really important. And so who is speaking in this chapter? Sorry, oh, yeah. Yes. Well, God, is, God is speaking. Isaiah. Or Isaiah is speaking. Okay. And Isaiah is referring to, I mean, that Messiah. Okay. But my question is, like, how about most of, like, I'm not sure if all or most, but, like, my point is, like, how about most of the chapters are not written in Hebrew? Or are they written in Hebrew? We know it by heart. No, let me just say this. You, you described your friends, I apologize, as secular. By definition, they're not studying the Bible. A religious Jew knows the verse chapter heart. We love it. Me, Heman, Lushmu, Zainu, Zeroy Hashem, Almi, That's Isaiah 53, verse 1. We know it by heart since children. It's delicious, it's yummy. We live with 53. 
Now, what you're going to say, imagine I would tell you, I spoke to a Christian who never goes to church except Christmas, and he didn't know what it says in Luke 19.27. You know, of course he doesn't he study the New Testament, he doesn't even go to church. So, yes, if you select a Jew that doesn't study Torah, who's secular by your words, of course you are pre-selecting your sample as someone who doesn't know. But if you speak to somebody who goes to yeshiva all their life, we eat, sleep, and drink Isaiah 53. Let me explain. Isaiah 53, you suggest that God is speaking. It can't be. Why? Because 53, somebody's talking or people are talking and they're saying, we have sinned. And surely he carried our transgressions. Did God sin? No way in the world, right? So God is not speaking. You say, Isaiah is speaking. Did Isaiah do these things? No. This is a narrative. There are people speaking here and the ones who are speaking, and then do you have a Bible? How many people have the Bible in this room? Raise your hand. Okay, I want everyone who has a Bible to please take it out. This is very critical. So first thing is, this is not only true for the Jewish Bible, it's true for any book. You have to know who are the speakers. And if you land in a chapter, you know, nine-tenths through a book, and we don't know who's talking, it's very unlikely you're able to figure out what is being conveyed in the chapter. We're going to do it together, okay? Those that are speaking in this chapter are the Gentile kings of nations. How do you know? Because it says it. In Isaiah 52, verse 15, and those of you who have a Bible, please read it for yourself. It says there <clears throat> that he will cast down many nations before him. Kings will go, <gasps> kings will, for what they will see, kings will be astonished because what they will see is like nothing they ever heard, and what they will witness is like nothing they had ever considered. Now, the chapter break from 52.15, that's the last verse of 52, and 53 is artificial. I know it's a surprise to people, but this chapter break that you see was invented by the Archbishop of Canterbury. His name is Stephen Langston in the Middle Ages. Okay, so that break is not a real break, it's an artificial break. And the kings of nations ask the question of 53.1. Me, hem, and lishmua say nu, that's plural. Who would have believed this, what we are hearing, shmua, shma, uzraya Hashem, and the arm of God, al me niglasa, upon whom was it revealed? And he grew up like a sapling before it, in dry ground. Who would have believed such a thing? So it's very important to understand that the speakers all the way through verse 8 are the Gentile kings of nations. It's the word of God, it's Isaiah, but Isaiah is prophetically telling us what the Gentile kings of nations will say when Mashiach comes. That's why we love this chapter, it's delicious. But yes, if I go to a, a place where a discotheque, <laughs> where Jews are dancing, Israelis are dancing, and I say, tell me Isaiah 1, they'll say, I have no idea. And I'm dancing with two girls, and I'm smoking a cigarette. I don't have time for it. So of course I can do it a Christian. I'll go into a disco, people are dancing, how am I doing? Right? Now let's go, I'll say, you don't know anything. But that's not a proper thing. You have to go to a Jew who's sitting and learning Torah day and night. Now, the question now, the big, big, big question, the fifty, sixty-four thousand dollars who is it speaking about? And this is where we encounter, it's not really a problem, but it doesn't say, never says the word Messiah anything in there, never, no. So then how do we know? We do know. Why? Because it's, it's God's servant. It's talking about God's servant. So the Gentile kings and nations are surprised at God's servants. So what's the obvious question? Who is this servant? We, how do we know the answer? Everything is at stake, my sister. We want to know, what does Isaiah think? Who is God's servant? Now, where am I going to look? In Ezekiel? No. If we're reading Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 in, is, in reality, the fourth of four servant songs, okay, which begin in Isaiah 41. So what we would do is, and I'm going to do this with you tonight, and everyone who has a Bible, take it out because you got homework. So watch for a moment. What we're going to do, because we want to be sure, you're going to decide if you're going to a synagogue on Shabbos or a church on Sunday. Big difference. So we have to be sure. Too much at stake, heaven and hell. If Christianity is true, you don't want to deny it, you'll go to hell. If it's not true, it's idolatry. I'm being honest with you. So what we do is, 
we walk back. And we see, we, if this is the fourth of four servant songs, if this is the case, can we walk this backward and see if the servant is identified? After all, if it was identified, it would have been identified in the first three servant songs. Is there something wrong with your back? I'm kidding. Okay, I'm joking. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, now who has the Bible? Raise your hand. Okay, we have homework. Okay, this is what you, I want you to do. I want you to open up Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9. Just find it. This is just for you, not you, in the back. 41, 8 and 9. For you, I want you to open up verse Isaiah 44, verse 1. Watch what I'm doing. I'm creeping to Isaiah 3. 44, verse 1. Who else has a Bible? Raise your hand. Raise your hand so I know who you are. You, you over here, do you have a Bible? Would you participate? I want you to read Isaiah 44, verse 21. Just find that verse. Who else has a Bible? Raise your hand. You do? I want you to open up Isaiah 45, verse 4. You're 45, verse 4. Who else has a Bible? I want you to raise your hand right now. I want you to open up to Isaiah 48, verse 21. Who else has a Bible here? Raise your hand. You have a Bible with you? I want you to open up to Isaiah 49, verse 3. Everybody got it? Let's go this over again. You're open up to Isaiah 41 verse 8 and 9. You're opening up to Isaiah 44 verse 1. Next one is opening up to 44 verse 21. The next one is 45 verse, you're 44 21, you're 45 verse 4, you're 48 verse 21. Who are you? 48, oh you got two, you're lucky, okay, okay. <laughs> and then I want you to open up 49 3. Find your places and tell me when you're ready. Because we are now uh, going to the God of Israel. That's where our answer is. We are not going below, we're going to go above. We want to know, what's Isaiah say? But I say it to you, please, don't be offended, but you have to read Isaiah in context. I mean, doesn't Isaiah have an opinion? Okay, so when everybody has their place, you all have your place? Okay, I want you, Red Hoich, I want you to speak loud. You're 41. Now what we're doing is you see, we're creeping up to Isaiah 3, and I'm going to show you every place where the servant is mentioned. Watch this. Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9. Read it. Loud. Uh, verse 8. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Verse 9. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called you from its farthest corners, and said to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have cast you on Thank you. Isaiah 44, verse 1. Yes, loud. But hear now, Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thank you. 45, verse 4. Loud. 44, oh, oh, 44, 21. Excuse me, go ahead. Loud. Remember these things, O Jacob, for you are my servant, O Israel. I have made you, you are my servant, O Israel. I will not forget you. 45, verse 4. That's you? Go ahead. Jacob, my servant, say, and Israel, my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, thou, though thou hast not known. 48, verse 21. I see a 48, 21. They did not thirst when he led them through the desert. He made water flow from them. You know, I just want to do it in context. My apologies. Could you just back up one verse, 48, verse 20? Leave Babylon. Leave free from the Babylonians. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaiming. Send it out to the hands of the Lord. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Thank you. I want to know 49, verse 3. Go ahead, read loud, loud, everyone hears you. 49.3. And said to be thou art my servant, Israel, and in whom I will be Lord. <laughs> Did I put this in your Bibles? Read for me, oh, oh, you have a Bible open right there. Would you find me Isaiah 43, verse 10? It's very famous. 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses. Listen carefully. And my servant whom I have chosen. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. Continue. 
so that you will know and believe in me and understand that I am He. Before me, nothing was created by a God, nor will be there be after me. And now let's give Hashem a big kiss. 43 verse 11, next verse. Anoichi, Anoichi, go ahead. I, only I, am Hashem, and, have, and there is no deliverer aside from me. Besides me, there is no Savior. Praise Hashem. So therefore, so, so in context, we know, not because some rabbi said, or I'm biased, or I, I don't like Christianity, chas v'shalom. But when you ask me, do I know the three? I do, but I also know the chapters that introduce it. And I would posit to you, it is fair to state that when Isaiah of blessed memory authored the 53rd chapter, he presupposed that you have already read the chapters that introduce it. And I would posit to you, if someone doesn't read the chapters that Isaiah presumed you would have read beforehand, and just read 53, you might get into a lot of trouble. Okay, that's one. Okay. Now the question is, what is going on here? The Gentile nations of the world are speaking about God's servant who is raised up, who is Israel. But what is happening here? The nations of the world are shocked. And it says so in scripture. They'll go, who would have believed this? Why? As it turns out, today, if you ask the nations of the world, why did the Jews suffer? Why do we go through these problems? So some will say, well, the Jews didn't accept Jesus. We didn't accept some other thing. And therefore, but when Mashiach comes and the whole world recognizes that God chose Israel and Judaism is the only truth, they have a monumental conundrum. This now brings us back to our question. Before Mashiach came, the non-Jews attributed the suffering of the Jews to their unbelief and rejection of the world's nations. But now that we know that the Jews always had the truth, and they were always God's servant, the original reason we attributed to the suffering of the Jew completely evaporates and has to be jettisoned. And therefore the Gentiles come to a completely new realization. There are many people here sitting in this room today that in fact, one of the things that moved you to embrace the Jewish faith, and I don't know you, I mean some of you I know, but I, I never asked, but I'm sure, there are many people who turn to the Jewish faith and who develop a deep love for the Jews because they witnessed the suffering of the Jewish people. They saw the bombs in Jerusalem. They saw the suicide bombs. They watched what happened in the Shoah, how the Philippines saved Jews, but how Europe exterminated them. And it drew them to the Jewish people. Many, many people, it is the suffering of the Jews that changed them and changed their complete attitude about the Jews. And that's what, he, that's what the holy, that's what they say, the nations of the world say. They say, by his stripes, by his suffering, we were healed. Yes. Yes, we came to the Jewish people. And we found a love for them because they suffer, suffered so darn much. But from the Holocaust, if it, we came to know the Jewish people and the truth of their message of the world. And in fact, as we get to Isaiah 53 verse 8, the very interesting passage, it says there, the last three words, the Goyim, the nations of the world are speaking, and they say the last three words, if you have it in Lush and Kodesh in Hebrew, it, the nations say, Mi pesha ami negalamo. What does that mean? For the transgret, Mi pesha, as a result of the iniquities of my people, negalamo, they, the Jews, were stricken. They suffered. What does that mean? It's very simple. When the Nazis persecuted the Jews, when the Germans persecuted the Jews, who suffered? The Jews did. We suffered as a result of the bad behavior of the world's nations. Now, the word lamo means them. In Hebrew, if you don't know Hebrew, how do you say him? Singular, lo. Lo is him, lamo is them. So the text says, for the transgression of my people, they were stricken, meaning the Jews. Now, your new international version that you have at home, or King James, or whatever one you use, you know what they do? They can't leave it. You wouldn't believe what I'm going to say. You'll look it up for yourself. They actually change it. It says, for the transgression of my people, they were stricken, and your Christian translations change to, he was stricken. The King James plays a game and says, to, because of the, our transgressions, the, the, the iniquity went there too, just ambiguous. How do you change the word of God? How do you make them into him? So the answer is that the, the, the Christians are very good people. I'm not patronizing you. 
believe me, I'm the last person to, I, I give it straight, but Christians are well many people who would give their lives for what they believe. The problem they, the is, really, is they're never reading the Jewish Bible in the original Hebrew. And really, I, I'll be honest with you, if you don't read scripture in its original language, it's like kissing God through a towel. <laughs> it just, you, the, the translators become your master. And they drag you by a trade, but a translation is a man-made, has to be man-made, has to read Hebrew. And the second thing Christians do, please, I hope I haven't offended anyone. Christians have a tendency, now there are a studious few who attend university who do read it. I'm not saying all do. But what tends to be is they have memorized certain verses or chapters. They have no idea what the chapter is before, what is after. They simply are given a card, know this verse so you can witness to Jews, and they don't know what's before and after. And then they complain the Jews don't know 53. In fact, we know 53, but we also know 41, 42, 43, 44. So the Christians are who strip out the text, not the Jews. I say to you with respect, there's a problem. It has to be a problem if somebody has such a selective knowledge of the Bible to to know one chapter, and other chapters are surrounded. So Isaiah 83 is a scheme that we find throughout the Jewish Bible, and that is when the true Messiah comes, the nations recognize their error. As it says in Jeremiah 16, verse 19, the Gentiles will come to the Jews and say, surely we've inherited lies and vanity where there is no truth. How can a man make unto himself God if they're not? Ask yourself an honest question. If we're wrong about Jesus, I mean, frankly, I mean, we're talking just here. If the Jews are wrong about the absolute most important subject in the world, Jesus, if we're wrong, why does every prophecy say that the Gentiles will come to the Jews and say we made a mistake? It should say the Jews will come to the Christians and they will admit they made a mistake. I mean, this is a reasonable question. Why would 10 Gentiles grab the shirt of a Jew and say, now we know God is with you? Why? Why does it say, if we're wrong, I mean, should think, let's just try the thing too. The Jews are wrong, Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus is the second person of the Triune Godhead. That means the Jews missed the boat completely on the singular most important issue of, of salvation. So why is everyone coming to us and say, we well, made a mistake? Well, the Jews should go, I apologize, I, we could have had a V8, I'm sorry, really. The Jews should be admitting, it doesn't make sense, it collapses. But Christians are good people. By the way, those of you here, you're learning, the, the people in the church are good people. Not everyone, everyone has lunatics. There's no shortage of them with us either. But the Christians are really genuine believers. They are, you have, you do not have my permission to use anything you've learned here tonight to God would attack a Christian. You speak to them with love and understanding and only use scripture. Never be disrespectful because they are sincere. The problem is, is that there's a selective knowledge and that, that leads people astray. I have many, many videos on YouTube, I'm not sorry to, I'm answering a question, about why, who is the Messiah, about, incidentally, there are Christian Bibles that are honest, also. I don't want to make it out to be that every Christian Bible is dishonest. There are some Christian Bibles that actually say exactly what I said. The New English Bible Oxford in annotation, New Revised Standard annotation. Read it. These are Christian Bibles. In the in the commentary, it says Israel is God's servant, and it's speaking of, and it's the Gentile nations that are speaking of the of the Jews. So I don't want to make this like every Christian believes this. There are many Christian scholars who recognize clearly Isaiah 3 is not talking about Jesus; it's talking about the Jews. The anchor the Christian the anchor Christian Bible all says that. I'm going to skip to who is the Messiah. I think was your question because. It's just that was the whole evening's program. But the Mashiach is supposed to bring, the, the Bible tells us what the Messiah would accomplish. Isaiah 11 tells us about the Messiah, the first three verses, who he's from. He's a descendant of Jesse. Jesse is the root. The Messiah is the branch. 2 and 3, it tells us that he'll be a righteous person. And verse 2, read Isaiah 11, verse 2 and 3. Open it up for yourself. It says the Mashiach is going to fear God. Isaiah 11, verse 3 begins with, he will be animated with the fear of God. If the Messiah is God, why would he fear God? Is he schizophrenic? Was <laughs> God afraid of himself? Doesn't make any sense. Please, any Christian Bible, open it up. Why would Mashiach, and incidentally I'm picking verses that all Christians believe is talking about the Messiah. 
and then it tells us about world peace and worldwide knowledge of God. But if you are told in the church that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, if that's the case, why would he fear God? What is he afraid of? It means he is God. God's not afraid of anything. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, Beterem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, Bechef Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra, Veacharem.